client is there unrepresented and the judge asks to see a document and the uh, litigant says, well, I'd given them to my lawyer, but the lawyer didn't give them back to me. It just doesn't sound good. It could be totally innocent, but there's things you can do simply just to protect yourself. Even your closing letter, please say, uh, I have these documents, please come in and get them or direct me where you want me to, uh, to send them. You might also want to keep copies of them before you send them back to your client. In the housing court, and this is for those of you who are court administrators in this, uh, uh, in this session, you might want to consider using color-coded limited appearance appearance forms and what has become uh, known in the housing court as the disappearance uh, notices, which is the withdrawal uh, notices. Keep them separate colors. Why? Because it's easier for the clerks and sometimes for the judges to be aware of when you're in and when you're out rather than having to sift through the, uh, the file. That's not something you have to worry about. But for court administrators who are listening to this, uh, it's something you may want to consider. Uh, the colors in the housing court, I've been told, are salmon and beige. Um, it uh, makes no difference to me. But are those the different court colors? <laughs> <laughs> beats me. Uh, the forms that we use are in pages 93 and 94 of your materials and page 95 of your materials. Now, another issue that can get a little bit sticky that you need to think about is you've gone in to argue a motion for a modification of a support order. You make your argument to the judge, and the judge takes it under advisement. The question is, when do you file your notice of withdrawal? You could file it immediately after you finish your argument at the end of the day. But if that happens, you won't get a copy of the order. So you have to make sure if you're going to do that, you got to make sure that your client gets you, notifies you about the order. The other thing you can do is wait until you get the decision. The problem potentially with that, with that is that there'll be other events taking place in the case and you are still have an appearance in that case. The clerk's office may not be paying as much attention to the nature of the appearance as we would all like to think that they would. So you start getting notices of next event and your client doesn't, creating some problems. Now each court needs to manage their own paper, but I just raise this as something that you should be thinking about making a, a, a specific discrete decision as to what you are going to do. And if you decide not to file your withdrawal that day, just remember to dock it sometime forward to file it so it's not forgotten. And the other point I want to comment on, because something that you had mentioned, is if the judge in the course of your argument wants to start discussing something else <clears throat> and you start getting involved and you start to address it, you are potentially inadvertently moving from a limited appearance to a general appearance. Now again, sometimes people make mistakes and I'll speak only for myself. I will not stick a lawyer with a general representation when they've just inadvertently forgotten to do something. It's just not fair. But you ought to at least be careful to keep track of what you're saying and what you're doing. And even if you, if the judge ranges, uh, addresses something, you can tell the judge, uh, judge, I'm here only uh, to address the summary judgment motion or the motion to dismiss. It's okay to tell the judge that. The judge won't uh, get angry at you because you're there in a limited uh, manner. Most of my colleagues are thrilled, absolutely thrilled with the expansion of limited appearance representation for the reason that you had said. Having a lawyer to articulate the issue is a much more efficient and fair way to adjudicate the issue than having an unrepresented litigant to do it. 
as I said earlier, you can appear multiple times in the same case on discrete events, but you need to dot I's, cross T's, and make sure the paperwork is there for each discrete event. I have uh, the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau practices my court, and they almost never file now, much to my annoyance, uh, <laughs> if, if David Grossman is listening, um, I'm repeating it again, uh, the fact that in some cases there'll be five or six appearances and withdrawal of appearances. However, the rule permits it, and a judge will not refuse to allow you to enter the appearances, and at the end of the day, if the client is getting representation on five discrete issues rather than one, most likely justice is better served by, by doing that. It causes more work for my administrative staff, but that shouldn't be the lawyer's concern. Your concern is to give your clients the best representation they can get, even if the scope is limited. The other thing is, if you're unsure of a practice in whichever court you are practicing in with uh, limited appearance representation, representation, ask, either ask the session clerk <coughs> or the clerk in the office, or even ask the judge so you understand specifically how it's done in that specific department. Uh, there's no harm in asking. I think that's uh, everything that I wanted to mention just in, uh, in terms of housing court practice, but I think it's been very successful. I think that the results on issues where there are lawyers who have entered limited appearance, uh, appearances have been uniformly better for the litigant than when they've done it on their own. And I found that there's little pushback and little anger or opposition to the other side. Because frankly, I think that lawyers representing one side are happier and uh, think that it makes their job somewhat easier if they can talk to a lawyer, even if it's for a discrete issue. So I think that you are doing something that uh, promotes justice, promotes fairness, and promotes efficiency. Great. Um, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of things that Judge Winnick said. Um, and uh, this issue about uh, when you file your notice of withdrawal is an interesting one. Um, hadn't occurred to me to think about what happens when you've got somebody that, uh, or a motion that's taken under advisement. Um, in connection with that, one of the things you want to think about is that in the SJC rule, uh, there's a provision, as Judge Winnick went through, for service of process, which was a big question. Um, if you're involved in a case and somebody on the other side is a limited appearance, who do you serve? When do you start? When do you stop? It was a big concern uh, for lawyers and uh, for the bar. And we resolved it by putting uh, a provision in the SJC rule which says once you file your notice of withdrawal, uh, you don't get served with process. So. Um, if you're in for a limited purpose and there's someone on the other side with a general appearance, uh, they copy both you and your client during the time that you're in there for a limited purpose. You file your notice of withdrawal, the lawyer on the other side doesn't have to serve you anymore. Uh, if you wait to file your notice of withdrawal until you get that uh, judge's uh, decision, then you could the other lawyer is going to have to serve you with process in the meantime. So it is a difficult, uh, we'll see how that works out. I'll be interested to hear how uh, other practitioners have found that uh, working out. Uh, one more thing, which is we didn't have time uh, to go through uh, an important part of the materials, which is at Appendix 2, um, which is on page 36 of your materials, which is best practices. Um, if you want to look at something that just is very understandable, very helpful, uh, which will uh, really help you with this practice. Uh, look at those best practices. Uh, they are, they are, uh, they've been revised and gone over, um, and I think you'll find them very helpful. Can I just take one other? Oh, uh, if you take a limited appearance representation, accept a limited appearance representation on short notice, it never hurts if you would, pr uh, if you think you could use some additional time to ask the judge. The worst that will happen 
is the judge will say no. So you should be ready to go and prepare to the extent you can, but don't be shy. Ask for the time if you think that it would better serve your, your client. So we, we want to open it up for questions here, but first I want to put a plug in. Very few hands went up for interest in the housing court, but let me encourage you to uh, attend one of the housing trainings at VLP. Uh, we put on a couple a year here at BBA and join us over at the housing court, uh, which had an unofficial sort of LAR for a long time. There was standing order of the court long before LAR that allowed the people volunteering there to make appearances in uh, motions to continue and, and other sorts of motions. So there's a lot of history there of um, opening it up to some limited representation. Uh, when you give a question, please speak loudly. We're going to repeat it so it'll be recorded, but also because other folks here were probably interested in the same thing. Yes, ma'am. Yes, everything. She was asking if the documents were online. If you go to the Volunteer Lawyers Project website, which is um, vlpnet.org, and um, go to libraries, you'll be able to find all of these documents under limited assistance representation. You will also have the opportunity to watch this training again. You've seen it in person. Now watch the movie. Yes, ma'am. All right, the question here is for new attorneys who don't feel that they know an area of the law, are there uh, resources available for them? And let me again put in the plug for the Volunteer Lawyers Project. Take a look at our website. We have all kinds of different projects and types of cases. We offer trainings regularly. The Boston Bar Association offers, uh, allows us to uh, put on trainings here, oftentimes at no cost to the folks who attend. So uh, don't forget to take full advantage of the what pro bono can do for educating you for practice. You guys want to yeah. add anything, please? Do you want to talk about the housing court? <clears throat> well, uh, Joanna is the uh, is is leading the the housing courts uh, uh, VLP uh, program. Uh, for new lawyers, it is spectacular. Uh, you actually could follow a lawyer, you know, experienced lawyers who are in the court, uh, especially on Thursdays, around. You can second seat them on on cases. Um, you can watch them both give clients advice, go through mediations with them, and then uh, start to, uh, to do it on your own with one of them uh, uh, there to assist you and, and give you advice. So from the housing court's perspective, it's a perfect opportunity for a younger lawyer or a lawyer who's in a law firm who doesn't get to go to court very often but wants the opportunity to stand up on their feet and actually represent someone in the, uh, in the well. It, it provides a unparalleled opportunity and you're doing good. You're doing uh, something that actually matters to uh, a lot of people who otherwise uh, would have to find their own way. Yeah. And uh, let me just comment too on the, on the probate and family court. Uh, uh, Judge Ginsburg does uh, a project called, has an organization called Senior Lawyers for Justice that uh, I'm not sure it's exactly a, what the it's another portal to vlp yeah so we're yeah on, it's, it's all on our website uh, closely affiliate affiliated with volunteer lawyers project so you can find it that way and they do um, a project uh, which involves uh, limited representation on fridays i believe in the suffolk probate court uh, they have experienced lawyers there um, and uh, uh, a lot of lawyers volunteering um, and i think what you'll find as a new lawyer um, is, first of all, uh, you'll be scared to death the first time you go in. Um, you know, that's to be expected. Um, you'll go in and get your feet, your feet wet and you'll realize, you know, this isn't rocket science every time you go into court. Uh, that if you understand what your client's looking for, uh, you've got the training with law school, you've got a sharp mind, and you can do a great job and you'll do a lot better for that client than if they're on their own. After a couple of times, you know, you begin to get your feet under you. Um, and uh, you're going to be watching other lawyers doing the same thing, uh, maybe more experienced lawyers. Uh, you've got uh, mentors, whether it's at the housing court or at the probate and family court. 
And I know when I first started at the probate and family court, once you started doing domestic relations, word spread quickly from client to client. And, you know, they start knocking on the door. They start coming in. And, um, you know, you can, you can build a very effective practice. Uh, and you could do it with limited representation. And uh, you get your experience through, uh, through the VLP uh, or at the housing court or at the probate and family court. And pretty soon you'll find out that those are familiar faces at that courthouse. You know the, you know the assistant register in the probate court? You know the judge? Uh, you know, you, you get a case and you realize, oh, I heard one like that argued two weeks ago. Um, and, you know, you spend a lot more time looking at the books than somebody who's been there a lot. Sometimes that's a good thing. Um, you know, you'll, you'll get over that very quickly. Um, so I, I strongly recommend that you do it. I, I did a lot of um, volunteering at the Boston Municipal Court uh, doing uh, lawyer uh, bar advocate work, which was uh, representing criminal indigents in jury cases. Um, and given where I was practicing, I wasn't going to see a jury for next, another 20 years. Uh, and we got paid some small amount, $25 an hour for out of court or something. Tremendous uh, practice. And it was, you know, uh, you get familiar with it. So I encourage you. This is a great way to do it. I would also suggest going to the courts in, in which you hope to practice and observing. I don't know about the probate courts, but I know that if you're observing in Judge Winnick's courtroom and he realizes that um, you're actually not doing anything in there, he often will call folks up at the end to ask if you have questions about what happened in there, and it's a, a, people have been thrilled with that experience. So, um, so observing in the courtroom, getting involved, using pro bono as an opportunity to learn we have mentors, we have mentoring sessions, we have what they call grand rounds at the probate court where they take you on a tour and you meet the clerks. Um, so not that I'm here to plug VLP necessarily, but I would like to say that there are lots of opportunities there. Yeah. Let me plug VLP, it's a, great, <laughs> it's a great way to get your feet wet and to begin to learn. All right, any other questions? Yes. The question here is whether or not there's been discussion about liability insurance and malpractice insurance for ghost writing. And there was. Uh, and, and the conclusion was, that's practicing law. Uh, if someone comes into my office and says, uh, you know, I've got uh, a, a divorce lawyer over at firm X, Y, and Z, and I've been working with him for a year, um, he's written this memorandum. Could you just look it over and give me a second opinion? No problem with that whatsoever. It's classic representation, right? And uh, if both of us are completely wrong and we're engaging in malpractice, then that's what the insurance is for. Uh, and the ghostwriting is really in the same, in the same you know, vein. Uh, I would suggest, as Judge Winnick has suggested, that to make sure that you, know, you don't ghostwrite or review other people's pleadings lightly, uh, you do take on responsibility uh, you shouldn't do it in an area that you're not familiar with. Uh, you should uh, make sure that you realize that that's a, an important engagement. And if you get it wrong, there is the possibility that someone could complain. Uh, so, you know, be diligent, be competent, uh, work hard at it. But the insurance question wouldn't be any different. Any other questions? All right, so um, we have the two breakout sessions coming up. You've got about um, eight minutes for a break and then, uh, then head on over to the, to the breakout session. Really appreciate all of you coming. I do hope you'll look at the uh, VLP let website, all the things that are available. Also the BBA, uh, which um, provides a lot of uh, low cost and no cost training for folks. Thank you. Please. I can. Do you get? Yeah, didn't either.
And excuse me, for anyone that's attending the probate and family um, breakout session will be remaining here, and anyone going to the land court session will be going up the stairs to the Claflin Center, so it's take a left when you get off the stairs. Thank you. Joanna, am I doing any of this? No, I'm you're, you're free. I'm done. This oh, is great. Trying to go get the dog. I got, I got off the plane at 2 o'clock yesterday oh. morning. Oh I'm gosh. going to sleep. I don't have that kind of stamina. Yes, I do. Okay, let me just make sure yes. this is... Oh, wait. Congratulations.